Time travel as psychotherapy. Spend an hour in the past to correct that one mistake you've agonized over for years. Or pay a man with a Viennese diploma to talk away the guilt. The effect was pretty much the same. It's just that one involved breaking the laws of physics. The bureaucracy wasn't much different, either. You might use extraterrestrial technology every day. You might see paradoxes created and resolved every hour. And you might see a dozen tortured souls made happy every week. But at the end of the day, there was still the paperwork. Paperwork, Redstone decided, flattened everything to the same level. A bill paid, a bill unpaid, a life reformed, a history erased, the impossible achieved, everything reduced to ink on a dead tree, and signatures on the right dotted line. Put them on the wrong dotted line, and the world was plunged into chaos. And not just the pretend world of management. Redstone stared at the form, and decided he needed coffee. No, he corrected himself, not coffee, a coffee break. He stood, stretched, and walked to his personal percolator on the filing cabinet. As he flicked the switch, something changed. It took a few seconds to realize what it was. The shadows in the room were different, and the background bustle of feet and voices in the corridor outside was gone. The scene outside his ground floor of his windows was replaced with a sheer blackness, as though they'd been painted over while his back was turned for a second. The distant rumbling hum of machines in the lab, a constant unnoticed presence for the last decade, also suddenly absent. The cooling fan in his old desktop computer was still spinning, and the percolator made its low bubbling, but there was no sound outside the room. He cautiously stepped outside into the corridor. It was empty, but with the familiar coolness of air and echo of his heels on the concrete floor. He walked to the end and took a left turn. The double doors of the canteen were ajar, and inside two dozen tables, half with unfinished meals and snacks. The canteen never closed, and there was always someone there, whether for morning tea, light lunch, or sandwiches for the night shift technicians. But right now, no one was serving and no one eating. Redstone absent-mindedly picked up a french fry from an abandoned plate of chicken wings, and munched on it, looking around. He reached down for another, and saw that the one he'd just taken was back on the plate. He finished chewing and swallowed, then cautiously ate the same one again. It reappeared on the plate from a momentary dark blur as he felt it sliding down his throat. Outside the canteen, the corridor continued for another several meters, but abruptly stopped before it could reach the lab. It didn't end in a wall, just in a slab of black nothingness. Tentatively, he reached out to touch the blackness, but was startled by a new sound, a telephone ringing. The telephone in his office. He sprinted back and bolted through the door, but stood uncertainly staring at the battered phone on his desk. After some hesitation, he picked up the receiver. Hello, Mr. Redstone. It is pleasant to finally speak with you. The voice was fuzzy and androgynous, and the words slightly disjointed, as though produced by a computer. Who is this? We are the Tomor. I see. It's good to finally hear your voice, too. Um, what just happened? Nothing. Where is everybody? There is nobody. Why is it dark outside? There is no light. No, I mean, why is there no light outside the windows? There is no outside. Redstone looked into the blank windows, trying to think of something to say. He slapped the phone switch to turn on the speaker, carefully put down the receiver, and walked to the cabinet, where he deliberately poured himself a cup of coffee, keeping his voice level. What happened to cause all this? And don't tell me nothing happened. I can see that nothing is exactly what's happening. I want to know what happened to cause it to be the case that nothing is happening, and what can be done about it. There was an odd pause before the answer came through the speaker. 
one of your economic collectives attempted to erase another from the flow of time, using methods stolen and reverse engineered from those which used Tomo technology. They were inexpert. Collective? Which ones? We do not understand human politics. To us, there are only good people and bad people. I think you'll find it's the bad people who did it. And they succeeded. Some other country attacked America. The agent and the target were both within the landmass called America. A civil war? We do not understand human politics. Uh, yes, of course. But what was the name of the collective which tried to erase the other collective? And what was the name of the other collective? The agent was Sonderheim Incorporated PLC. The target was North Coast Services. Never heard of them. What did they do? What did they make? Weapons? We do not understand human politics. Ah, uh, yes. So you said. So what can you do to undo the damage? Nothing. Nothing. Nothing? Do you mean nothing as in everything will fix itself if we wait? Or do you mean some special kind of nothing is what you have to do to make it right? What? There is no course of action available to us which can reweave the broken flow into a state resembling that of before the rupture. Inaction will also effect no change. So, there's nothing you can do. That is correct, Mr. Redstone. We are sorry. It was our pride which led to this. You? How is it your fault? We believed humans could never acquire our technology. And even if they could, they could not understand it. And even if they could, they could not recreate it. And even if they could, we could prevent the consequences. We were wrong. Oh, well, it wasn't your fault. If we hadn't used Time Tech, we'd have probably used nuclear bombs eventually. But wait, why am I still here? Why is this building still here? There were many anomalous bubbles formed by the rupture. The part of the building which your body occupies was inside one such bubble. It is outside normal time and space. I see. Well, I don't, but... So it's dark outside because there's no sun outside. There is no space through which any starlight could travel, even if there were a star. Um, yes. Thank you. So how come the electric lights are still working? Your fluorescent devices are powered by the electricity they would have received had they still been connected to the power grid, had it still existed, had the rupture not occurred. I think I'm just going to have to pretend to understand that one. Where there are anomalies, others may be created. We have managed to save a few living creatures by fine-tuning anomalies in which they were trapped to provide them with air, food, and comfort. Then I thank you again. You say a few. How many? 1,817 humans. 403 dogs. 371 cats. 114 horses. 97 billion colonies of bacteria. 37,000 mice. 200... Yes, I get the picture. And the other billions of humans? Gone? Dead? Some are trapped in temporal loops. Some exist at only single points in time. Many exist as disconnected moments. The majority have never existed. And the others? The other people inside their bubbles? Do they know what's happened? We have found ways to communicate with the majority and are endeavoring to contact the remainder. I don't wish to seem ungrateful, but... You've saved me and a few thousand people and animals and all we've got is your voice on the telephone for the rest of our lives. Some people would call that... Hell. Do you understand? We always try to do what seems to be right. Yes, well... And we are lonely. The Tomo, lonely? It is not enough simply to offer help to those whose needs are not met. We also have a need to share existence with others to communicate and be communicated with. For us, to dwell at all is to dwell in company. 
Who'd have thought it? We always wondered what you got out of humanity. It turns out you got companionship. So, um, tell me about yourself. How many of you are there? Why can't we ever see you? There was another long pause, and Redstone remembered to take a sip of his coffee. The answer, when it came, was fluent and rapid, as though the delay was carefully to script it all before reciting. We do not have number as you do. We are neither individuals, nor a group, nor a gestalt. You would conceive of us as an undifferentiated mass. The fragment that arrived by accident upon your planet resembles a single drop from an ocean, infinitely divisible and so infinitely large, but also an infinitesimal division of a sizeless whole. We avoided direct contact because our form is not of a body extending in three spatial dimensions and moving through a fourth of time, but of a body extending in n spatio-temporal dimensions and moving in others. We have learned that corporeal contact can be dangerous for your kind and ours. I think I understand. Mm, sort of. But, Mr. Tomor, if I can call you that, there must be something we can do. I can't hang around in here for the next fifty years, going slowly insane. I need company, too, of my own kind. There has to be a way to go back and prevent this rupture from occurring. There is no longer a timeline upon which to travel, Mr. Redstone. The tone was identical with previous utterances, and any hint of gentle reproof had to be imaginary. But... but... the human timeline may be gone, but the Tomor timeline, surely that's still there. I mean, you saved me from the rupture, so it can't have erased you, right? That is correct. So you have the power to go back into your own history and prevent those stupid humans from messing around with your technology. It is forbidden. Forb? Why? To permit one individual to briefly revisit their own past, to correct a minor personal mistake, to increase personal happiness, that is permitted. However, to interfere with pivotal events in the history of an entire species, or even the lives of many individuals. This could corrupt the timeline of an entire world, down to substrate level, as you are experiencing. You're saying, if you interfere with more than an insignificant part of your own history, you could cease to exist, just like we've done. That danger would exist if a significant fraction of the Tomor were involved with the human species. But even if there were not, it would be forbidden. Why? Another strangely long pause. The line noise of the telephone also cut out when they weren't speaking through it, as though they regarded noise as part of the speech itself. The answer, when it came, had the same flat, fuzzy tone as before, with the same slightly exaggerated intonation. Ethics. Redstone waited for more, but it seemed they thought they had explained themselves sufficiently. And who decides on these ethics? What's their basis? We have made mistakes in our encounters with other worlds. Mistakes for which we cannot atone. We will not allow ourselves the pride to repeat them. There's that word again. But I've seen you bend your own rules before. That woman who saved her grandchildren, she destabilized the timeline, but you let her do it, and you fixed the damage she caused. Her actions were noble. Oh, okay. Just hypothetically, if you could go back or send me back, could this rupture be prevented? No. Why not? The event is in the human timeline, not that of the Tomor. You're going to have to give me more information. We have kept our interactions with the human species minimal. When we acted, we acted through intermediaries such as yourself, and we ensured the ramifications were small. We took no part in the events which erased the human species. Had we done so, we could, in principle, prevent them. So you're saying the only part of human history you have access to is where it intersects with your own history? That is correct. Redstone thought carefully and deliberately, staring at the windows and taking a slow mouthful of coffee. 
then there's one event you could change. And it would undo all the damage my species has done. Go back to the day you crashed. Make sure you never meet humanity, and we never get to mess around with time travel, and we never destroy ourselves in the process. You could do that, right? The answer was immediate. It would entail the loss of all benefits accrued since our arrival. All the second chances gone. For just one second chance. All those people who got to go back and make their lives a little bit better. Back where they were. I think that's worth it. Silence. The sound of thinking, or offence, or just of having nothing to say. Redstone tried again. Did you hear me, Mr. Tomor? I said I think it's worth it. You've done nothing but good since you got here, and now the most good you can possibly do is make sure you didn't arrive. The decision cannot be ours alone, nor yours alone. We must consult with the other sentient beings who were saved, and we must examine our own values. But it's obviously what needs to be done. You can save us, and that mistake of pride you mentioned, you'd never have made it. It's good for everyone. More silence. It stretched out. Redstone spoke much louder than he intended. Can you hear me? Mr. Redstone, we have discussed your proposal with all the other sentient beings concerned. Oh, that was quick. The process took slightly more than one century. Ah. And the consensus is that we change our own local history to prevent our meeting with the human species, thus creating a new human timeline from that point. The anomalies will be erased, including your current existence. We will retain the memory of both our timelines. That's good. When will you do it? The process has already started. If you have any final messages or requests, now is the time to state them. Messages? Uh, I hope that someday humanity will meet the Tomo again. And I hope that by then we have the maturity not to mess it up that time. The office started to blur. Redstone looked at his own hands, watching them also become indistinct. When he spoke, his voice had a far away quality to his own ears. Mr. Tomo, I would like to see you before I... before everything resets. Is that possible? Colors faded, and everything in the room seemed to melt outward, becoming unrecognizable in a uniform gray haze. Tomo? The last of the haze faded away, leaving only the deepest black. His old cutthroat razor, it lay in his shaking hand, freshly sharpened and waiting. Martin White, widower, father, working up just a little more courage to make the first cut.